Thank you, thank you, Fiz, and uh, let's uh, go ahead with the Dr. Benita Shah's talk on the uh, prevention of kidney disease. All right, thank you again so much for having me here. I'm so far I very much enjoyed it today. Um, the great cases that are being shown. So, um, I, you know, the talk is prevention of kidney injury during PCI. And I purposely wanted to make sure to highlight kidney injury rather than contrast induced nephropathy because acute, acute kidney injury can happen not just as contrast, it can happen from a variety of different um, etiologies. Here, here are my disclosures. So I'm going to start off with a case, a 66-year-old man with stage 4 CKD, GFR is 29. The patient also has diabetes, he's on insulin, high blood pressure, and presents with class 3 exertional angina for a few weeks. He also has a foot ulcer, and it turns out he has osteomyelitis that's not responsive to antibiotics, and he needs vascular surgery. The medications, he's on DAPT, high-intensity statin, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and some additional antihypertensive medications. His troponins, minimally elevated, 0.42 was the peak, our upper limit of normal is 0.04. And his echo shows a normal ejection fraction with the anterior wall mild hypokinesis. So just to highlight for this patient, just starting off with the GFR of 29, puts him at much higher risk of one-year mortality when you're looking at the, the light gray. That's, those are patients who develop AKI. In this case, it was uh, CIM that was studied. So contrast-induced nephropathy is one-year mortality and be up to 44%. We didn't develop an AKI post-procedure, his one-year mortality would be 15%. So it makes a big difference. So how do we go ahead and try to prevent post-procedural AKI? I'm going to highlight um, this one study, the Poseidon trial, because I think it's an underrated trial and it's super easy to apply to our patients on a regular basis. It was a relatively small study, 400 patients were randomized to LVDP guided hydration therapy versus standard hydration therapy. And this really just involved putting in a pigtail before starting the procedure, checking the LVDP, and then adjusting the weight of the scale in the point. And if you took a 70 kilogram patient, if the LVDP was less than 13, you would have 350 cc's of normal saline water for four hours post procedure. If the LVDP was 13 to 18, you gave 210 cc's, and if it was greater than 18, you gave 105 cc's. Versus the standard hydration, hydration therapy of 105. And I can tell you that ever since I started doing this, I realized that we, at least in our group, we were chronically underhydrating these patients. You know, the routine, the fellow would put in 150 cc's of normal saline, and more often than not, they required more. They showed um, a significant decrease in the rate of uh, increasing in, in, in AKI, as well as uh, one year base. This was largely driven by uh, renal events. So uh, we have an automated injector in our lab, so if you do have an automated injector, a little trick that we've come to use is setting the contrast injector for one for two cc's in between cines. And that way, if you end up giving little taps, you don't end up giving too much contrast for those slight checks. Our goal is to give um, as little contrast as possible. I know we talk a lot about zero contrast protocol, but honestly, Giving 10 cc's of contrast during a case is not that much different from 0 cc, so you should give contrast when you need to. Um, and I would say the goal would be that your total contrast is up to the GFR. So in this case, the GFR was 20, so I wanted to stay below 30 for the contrast. I highly recommend good angiography, particularly for our fellows who are in the audience right now. You know, Take the time to do good shots so that all you need is three pictures and you have all of your answers. So I'm just going to give you an example. This is a flat LAO for an RCA. But if you get an LAO cranial view, which is here on the right, you can see that the entire distal RCA and uh, bifurcation is well split out. And here, if you take a cranial view of the LAP, you want to be at least 40 degrees. So if you're 35, you're going to miss sometimes. You're going to get some overlap. But if you go extreme, if you go 40 or above, you'll really see that osteo-LED and um, entire uh, uh, 
costs. So you know this becomes even more important when you're trying to live in contrast to just come down to a few games. Stage the PCI wherever possible, especially if you've already used a fair amount of contrast for the diagnostic. And then uh, iris guided or imaging, uh, iris guided PCI would know, be ideal. And then the last thing to recommend is um, uh, transradial access. We do know at least from sub-studies of large randomized trials and large observational studies, all the data is consistent in the fact that with patients who have a lower GFR, transradial access is associated with more favorable outcomes. There's a lot of questions as to why that might be. And we think that the benefit is partly due to um, bypasses the descending artery. So here is a nice CAT scan where you can see in the descending artery there's a whole lot of black. And you see this a lot in our tower CTs when we're working up patients with aortic stenosis. And very minimal plaque in the ascending aorta. So um, perhaps we're decreasing the risk of atherotomalitis and kidneys in, in these patients. But um, the, the question of mechanism of benefit is still up there, guys. Okay, so going back to our case, we did a transrenal approach, checked the LVDP, it was 10. Uh, so we ended up starting 300 cc an hour normal saline. With a nice LAO cranial shot here, you can see some uh, diffuse disease in the PDA. And here you can see a subtotal CERC, slash LPI, the OF is okay. And you can see a long uh, uh, proximal to mid LA lesion that crosses the bifurcation of a very large diet. So in this case, we had already used uh, about 20 cc's of contrast. Um, because this patient we continued normal sealing afterwards, his GFR remained stable uh, through the through three days post-op or post-cath. He ended up undergoing a BKA under a local block and then came back to us after he finished his course of antibiotics uh, from PCI. So we used our diagnostic picture as our still image so that we didn't have to recreate a roadmap. So we just took the old diagnostic picture and put it up side by side. Um, the LVDP we checked was still low, we started fluids. And so we started off with, um, uh, when you're engaging the guide, if you inject saline, you'll see, and watch the EKG monitor, you'll see some T-wave changes. And if you see the T-wave changes, you know you're in. Or um, you can just free wire from the from the aorta. So we wired the LAD using our previous diagnostic as a roadmap, and then started off with IBIS. Highly recommend if you're going to do IBIS for an ultra low contrast protocol to do an automated approach uh, and to use the sled wherever possible, and that way you can get your length measurements as well. Um, there wasn't much calcium, so we got our measurements and. Um, I wired the diagonal, put in a small 1.5 balloon, just inflated it to 10 atmospheres to maintain vacancy. And then using our IBIS uh, measurements, took um, a pre-dial balloon. Okay, so I had mentioned that we want to use
So as I mentioned, we used contrast uh, just while we were ready to position the scent. Uh, post dilated to with a 3 balloon based on our previous IBIS measurements. And then we did a final IBIS. Um, and, and I opted at this point in time to do a final angiogram as well. So we ended up using um, uh, 15 cc's of contrast for, for the procedure. And the patient remains stable post-op. Okay, one more case I'll show you. 72 year old woman with an end stemmy and a GFR of 30. We took radial access. Um, because we had 7 on 1 for 2, it ended up being a non dominant RCA, we just used fluorosave to store the little tap. Um, we did not end up giving too much contrast there. And we saved the contrast for our left side, which we knew was going to be um, dominant. And here you can see there's a distal circulation, which we opted to fix. Um, I was guided as well as an LAB bifurcation. So I'm just going to start, I just want to go through some of the key points that we used here for the uh, LED diag bifurcation lesion. Um, especially if you don't have ready access to IBIS, um, I really do like the idea of putting in multiple wires inside branches for your markers. So if you take your angiogram and there happens to be a large septal or a large diag at the proximal or distal edge, something that gives you an idea as to where to start ballooning and where to uh, position your stent to minimize your contrast use, I would highly recommend that. Um, I did that in this case uh, regardless, um, because e even though we were using iris, I still occupied the uh, wire and the dyad. And again, I only used um, uh, contrast when we were positioning the stent. And then I opted to just preemptively do uh, an undersized balloon in the dyad. So we took the third wire to rewire the dyad, and that way we didn't have to worry about trying to figure out where the original dyad was. Sequentially ballooned and ended with a kiss. And then our eye showed a well-opposed, well-expanded stent uh, with no edge or guide dissection. And again, I want to emphasize the use of automated, automated pullbacks when you're using IBIS here so that you don't miss uh, under-expanded areas. So really, those are just my, my tips, tricks, and pearls for preventing AI in this case. So, so sorry, getting back to your question. <laughs> you're saying academic centers are more uh, likely to be aggressive with how we do an international test is perfect with the low contrast and zero contrast. But then the patient goes to the floor and a different team is managing the patient. And at least in the United States, we have a, a guideline directed medical therapy push towards that, which includes early uh, uh, initiation of uh, ACE, ARP or a uh, diabetic plus uh, either spinal lacto and people with urologic. And trust, so, yeah, everything, everything gets thrown on board all at once. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that is a major issue. And I always tell the fellows um, that they need to be mindful of the hemodynamics around the time of calf as well as volume status around the time of calf. So just like in a perioperative setting, you don't want to suddenly you know, give them aggressive beta blockade and bring their heart rate rate down to 50 just in the immediate um, perioperative setting. You don't want to do that for a cath in terms of blood pressure and volume. Because it's not all about the contrast, it's about the hemodynamics. And if your patient is hypotensive or has a low volume status, they're at higher risk of having an API post-procedure. Um, so, so when the fellows ask, oh, we've been diuresing this patient, can we continue the Lasix? I say you have to monitor the eyes and nose very closely and maintain eulopia. So that usually involves holding the Lasix for a day or cutting down the dose in half. But whatever it is, uh, you're not gonna do a net diuresis within the first 24 hours of the procedure. That's why I want to add uh, another question on the clinical scenario. I have a patient, a patient with low uh, renal transplantation, a patient with three uh, lesions, small lesions, and we put three, we put three scale in three basic. But uh, before uh, actual procedure, uh, PCI, we do the uh, hemodialysis, and after the procedure of PCI, again we do hemodialysis. But I want to know, and to know that uh, what's the first thing that you so when to do dialysis? So there isn't, there aren't great data here. 
But again, I'm going to go back to the point of um, giving strict instructions to the dialysis center to, to make sure that the, the patient is met even and not to take off too much volume. Um, because we do have very good data to show that patients who show up to the cath lab hypovolemic end up having a higher risk of having an AKI. And you certainly don't want to continue that in the in the immediate post post cath procedure setting. So I tell them, um, it doesn't matter to me what, when they're dialyzed, pre or post. It does matter to me how much volume has been taken off recently. And, uh, and if they're going to go post cath, then to make sure that they don't take off too much volume. That they, they guide it based on the LVDP. So that one you know, quick LVDP at the beginning of the procedure gives you so much information as to where the patient's volume status sits and whether or not they want to get volume back. Thanks, Peter. I know that. So, uh,